Hello, my name is Diego Eriksson and welcome. Today I have a very special guest. He was Elvis Presley's uh, spiritual advisor, he was his very good friend and he was his hairdresser. The man's name is Larry Giller. Welcome Larry. Stig, it's really good to see you and I remember the last time we were together, I think it was about three years ago when I was in Denmark and uh, we had a good time and uh, I was at your house and uh, I remember it very well. And I'm glad to be here with you today, especially under these new circumstances that we're all experiencing. We're in our brave new world now, but thankfully we have devices like we're using today and we get to talk to one another and I can express myself and so can you. <laughs> Yeah, it's amazing actually because three years ago I would probably never have been doing any interviews on the internet. But today I have started making interviews on the internet like today you and I can sit and talk with such a long distance. It's it's amazing. It is amazing. I mean, well, we're, Larry, say, uh, we're about uh, five, how many thousands of miles? Are we eight, nine thousand miles away right now? I think so. And there's no delay. Wow. In the book. Incredible. And I'm glad to have you here, Larry. And today we are going to talk about the spiritual side of Elvis and the spiritual things you shared with Elvis uh, through the years you knew him. But uh, just a little bit about yourself, Larry, to begin with. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about yourself as a kid and where you grew up and how you met Elvis? Oh, sure, sure. I grew up uh, in the 1950s in Southern California, Hollywood, and uh, it was a very exciting place to grow up, especially in the 1950s. And uh, when Elvis came on the scene in 1956, I became a fan on the spot. I knew every song, every word to every song. And I went to parties on the weekend and I would imitate Elvis. I was a major fan. And one day in 1957, I was getting ready to graduate high school. And I guess I was around six, 17 years old. And we heard that Elvis was coming to town for a concert. And we didn't know from concerts back then. You know, we take all this for granted today, but back then we didn't even know what it was. We know we find out where he was going to perform. And so my best friends and I, we had a, cl uh, a club in high school. We all went to the Pan Pacific Auditorium. And when we got there, we saw something that we never experienced in our lives. Thousands of kids coming in from all directions. We never saw this before. It was amazing. And there was an electricity in the air because it was all about Elvis. And my friends and I, we didn't understand that you had to have tickets. We were that naive. And we thought we'd get in to see the show. And all of a sudden, most of the people entered the auditorium and we're standing there looking and all I knew was I had to see Elvis. I wanted to see him in person. So my buddies and I went to the side of the building and we tried to yank open a door and it wouldn't open. And we went to another one, it wouldn't open. Then we ran out in the front and went to the very far side of the building. And all of a sudden, I said to my, my five friends, I said, look, look, there's Elvis. Elvis was standing about 15 yards away with a few of his bodyguards. I said, come on, you guys, come on, let's go meet him. And when I looked at my friends, I realized they were scared. They were petrified. They wouldn't move. They were just staring at Elvis. I said, well, I'm going, you guys. And I ran up to Elvis, Stig. I yeah. ran up there. 
And when I got to him at, in those days, I was much shorter than him. Elvis was about six feet, six feet tall. And I ran up to him and I looked up at him and I'm looking at that face, the hair, the sideburns, those eyes, those famous curled lips. And I'm just looking and Elvis smiles at me. He said, hi, I'm Elvis Presley. And I said, I started to stutter. <laughs> I was so <laughs> nervous. I said, hi, Elvis. My name is Larry Geller and it's so great to meet you. And the minute I said that, one of the guys with Elvis said, Elvis, you're on, man, now. Come on, they want you. You're on, let's go. And Elvis looked at me very casually. He said, well, you heard what they said, kid. I got to go talk to you some other time. And he walked off. I stood there in shock. I'm in the Elvis zone. Strangers are coming up to me and shaking my hand. I don't know what's going on. All I know is, know is that moment really impacted my life strongly. Well, a couple of months later, I graduate high school. I enter college and I was floundering. I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. And a friend of mine suggested that I become a hairstylist because I was very artistic and I took art in, uh, in school. And I, I, I thought about it and I thought it might be a good idea. I entered beauty college called the Hollywood School of uh, Cosmetology. And I went through the course, got my license, and I had got a job in Beverly Hills, in one of the top salons through a friend of mine. And before I started, I met a man who said to me that he was opening the very first salon for men, for men's hairstyling in America. Didn't exist in those days. We're talking 1959, June. He said, listen, Larry, forget doing women's hair. Start with me. And by the way, his name was Jay Sebring, if that rings a bell with anyone. Yeah. Uh, and he said, we're going to start a new industry. We're going to be pioneers. We're innovators. And what we did was we shampooed the hair first. We styled the hair. And in those days, uh, men went to traditional barber shops for like a dollar. We charged ten dollars, which was unheard of in those days. That's like if you went right now to get a, a hairstyle and it would cost you five hundred dollars. I mean, that was the equivalency of the exchange back then. Yeah. We opened our doors right off the bat immediately. Every major star in Hollywood started to come to us. Amazing. And our clientele, Stig, it read like a Hollywood who's who. I'm 20 years old, and all this is happening. We did the hair of Frank Sinatra, Marlon Brando, Steve McQueen, Paul Newman, Peter Sellers. Roy Orbison, Glenn Campbell, you, you name the celebrity, the star of television, motion pictures, recording, the directors, the producers, the agent, they came, we were the only show in town. And so all those TV shows of the 60s and a, a majority of the motion pictures represents our work. So things were going very well for me. I'm doing Peter Sellers hair and Henry Fonda and uh, uh, Roy Orbison. I was doing Sam Cooke's hair. I was doing a lot of very interesting, wonderful people. Yeah, just one question about these interesting people before you continue, because I want to hear more, but I'm just sure. curious. I, I like Frank Sinatra a lot. How was he? 
what kind of what kind of a guy was he? I mean, yeah, how how, how kind of a guy he was, was he? A easy very, to... He was a very interesting guy. He had a terrific sense of humor, and it was really exciting to be around him. And he had his his own entourage of people, and he was uh, it was a very exciting uh, moment for me. Yeah. And at any rate, one afternoon. This is about five years later. Now we're into April of 1964. And I'm styling hair at the salon and my phone rang. I picked it up and I heard this voice say to me, uh, Larry, uh, I'm sitting here in Bel Air, which is right next to uh, Beverly Hills. I'm sitting with Elvis Presley and he wants to know if you would like to come up to his house to fix his hair for him. And I'm thinking, I don't believe it. Here I am, Rock Hudson and Warren Beatty and all these fantastic people. But Elvis then was the celebrity of celebrities. He was the biggest star in the world. And today, as we know, he's the, most, the biggest, most beloved star that ever lived. I was so excited. I said, yes, I'd love to. So he gave me directions and I said, I'll be there shortly. And I packed my bag with all my tools and I run out the door. And as I'm running out, the receptionist says to me, Larry, Larry, Peter Sellers is on the phone. He wants you right now. <laughs> I said, tell Peter, I'll call him later. <laughs> I didn't care who it was. It didn't matter. We're talking Elvis, all right? <laughs> so I drive to Bel Air. Someone meets me at the famous Bel Air gates, and I follow them up the winding road and go to this very interesting street. And the minute I saw it, I knew which house it was because I saw dozens of fans of every age, of every type, outside Elvis's gates. I drive in and people are screaming, tell Elvis I love them, tell him I'm here. And <laughs> it was <laughs> my first taste of the Elvis world. <laughs> I walk into Elvis's house. I look around and he's sitting at a table. He's wearing, a, he was wearing a, a, a cap, a motorcycle cap that was made famous by a Marlon Brando in a movie that he made called The Wild One. And I was just sitting with a couple of guys at a table in the kitchen. He said, I'll be right with you, man. And someone takes me into the den. And about 30 seconds later, Elvis walks in with the entourage behind him. He walks up to me. And he had that same inner glow, that, that reservoir of energy that was just burning off of him. And he walks up to me with that Elvis smile and he puts his hand up. He said, hi, I'm Elvis Presley. <laughs> and all of a sudden, Sig, I'm having a flashback. Yeah. Eight years earlier, eight years. Hi, Elvis, I'm there <laughs> And I put my hand out and I said, hi, Elvis. And now I'm about uh, two inches taller than him. I grew up at that point. Yeah. And I said, hi, Elvis. I'm Larry Geller. Great to meet. I said the same thing that I said back then. Only now it was cast in a total, a total different setting, a different light. He said, well, come on. Let's go into my bathroom. You fix my hair. We'll talk. I said, great, Elvis, great. We walk into his bathroom and I'm looking and I thought I would see, you know, a big salon chair and the light bulb, and, but nothing like that. It was a big bathroom, but it was very plain. And it was a, little, a small basin. And Elvis said, come on, we'll do it right here. Very casual, just like that. And I said, okay, I put a towel around him. He puts his head down. I turn the faucet on. At the salon, I have someone do this for me. 
And so I am being extremely fastidious, very, very cautious of everything I do. I pour the shampoo and I'm, I lather it up and I'm rinsing it out now and I'm rinsing. I don't want them to get wet or anything like that. And all of a sudden, Elvis picks his head up like that and he starts shaking his head back and forth and water starts splattering everywhere. It's hitting me. And he is now getting drenched with water and he starts laughing. And he says, hey, Larry, what the hell, man? At least it's clean. And I got to tell you, when Elvis said that to me, I instantaneously recognized this guy is so down to earth. And there's a lot of celebrities. They want you to know they're celebrities. They want you to know who they are. And they have this, this armor, this, this ego stance, so to speak. Not all of them, but some. Elvis was the absolute reverse. He was natural. And because of it, it put me at ease because I was nervous. Even though, you know, I, I, I'm skilled in what I, I, I do, what I did back then, because I don't do that anymore. <laughs> uh, I, I, I was confident, but this is Elvis. And so, it, you of know, of course, you're I, nervous meeting him. You know, I can understand that. And I, also, when you were a fan, of course, even you were a professional hairdresser, of course, you were nervous. Uh, I would have been nervous. Yeah, exactly. It's only natural. Yeah. But he made me feel at ease by saying that. And I, you know, I could have been his gardener, his auto mechanic, or I could have been a senator or president. It didn't matter. Elvis treated every person as a human being. So he said, come on, man, we'll do, you can do my hair over here. We went in front of a large, the large mirror, marble ledge, and he's explaining to me that he was making a movie called Roustabout. He said, Larry, I'm in the middle of it, and so you can't cut too much off because the scenes have to match. I said, believe me, Elvis, I understand. Just leave this to me. I know exactly what to do. He said, okay, man. And I started to do his hair. And I'm working on him, and not a word was spoken. And I, if he wanted to engage in conversation, I'm available. But I also want to respect his space and his privacy, and I'm allowing him to take the lead. I have my work to do. So I cut his hair and I dry his hair and I start to spray it. And I'm looking at him in the mirror as I'm kind of molding his hair like that. I said, what do you think, Elvis? He said, beautiful, beautiful. And he spins around in the chair and he puts his finger like right here. He said, wait a minute, Larry, who are you? Who are you, man? What are you really all about? What are you really into? I almost went into shock when you did that. Yeah. I'm, I said, my, I'm thinking to myself, my What's God. What's going on? <laughs> what? I'm in Elvis. How did I get in Elvis Presley's bathroom? This is really him. And he's asking me this. I'm here to do his hair. And he's asking me something so personal, so intimate. And I said, well, wait a minute, Elvis, uh, uh, you, and I, I started to stutter. I said, I, I, I understand what you're asking me. Look, you know what I do for a living. And I work on a lot of celebrities and I love what I do. And I go to the studios and I've been to Vegas on calls at times. And this is where I make my money. But I hear what you're really asking me and I'm going to tell you. What's more important to me than anything else in my life is I, I need answers. I need to know why I was born in the first place and why, what, what I'm doing here. I had to find out, is this all just an accident? 
Is this just what the scientists tell us, that it, this is a bunch of atoms that evolved over billions and billions of years? Or is there a master plan? Is there, is there an intelligence? Is there a God? What happens to us when we go, Elvis? I said, look, I read a lot of spiritual books, a lot of metaphysical books, books on all the religions. I don't care what religion it is. I don't care if it was written 2,000 years ago or it's modern. I don't. I want to know the answers. I'm. I'm. I'm a. I became a vegetarian. I do a lot of meditation. And, and at that point, Stig, I'm realizing I'm telling this to Elvis Presley because we have to recognize this is 1964. Today, turn on the television and people are talking about this. This has become mainstream. The bookstores are filled with books like this. There has been a spiritual revolution that really began in the 60s with the explosion of our culture in so many ways. But that was back then and people didn't talk about these things. Yeah. And I knew it. And I was aware that I was telling Elvis Presley something that was almost verboten. And people, you're not afraid when you were telling him that when you talk to him about these things, were you a little bit afraid? how he would react to it and say, oh, I, I was, don't want to be anymore. You said it, Sid. I was ex that's exactly what I was going through, because as I'm explaining this to Elvis, I'm thinking, this is Elvis Presley. He'll, he might think I'm some kind of a nut. Yeah. He never met me before. I said, look, Elvis, I know that you're Elvis Presley. <laughs> you're the biggest star on planet Earth. This probably sounds corny to you. You know, I'll stop. He said, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. No, 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 Larry. You have no idea how I need to hear what you have to say. Please, just keep on talking. I need to hear this because this is what I secretly think about, especially at night when I go to sleep. And I think to myself, why me? Why me? Why did I have this, this life? Why did I become Elvis Presley? And he said, Larry, do you know that, you know, I, I, I have a twin brother that was stillborn. I said, I know Elvis, I, I, I know about your life. He said, his name was, his name was Jesse Guerin. He didn't make it, but I did. And I'm here now talking to you. What would have happened if he survived and I didn't? Would you be doing Jesse's hair right now? What if both of us survived? Would we have called you to do both of our hair? Would we be called the Presley Brothers? Why me? Why was I plucked? And he went like this. I'll never forget. Why was I plucked? out of all the millions and millions of lives to become Elvis Presley. I have questions just like you do, Larry. He said, man, if you knew where I came from and how I grew up, I was born in the heart of the, uh, the Depression. My family didn't have anything. That's why I was born at home. We couldn't even afford to be to go to a hospital. My mom and dad, they had nothing. And what would have happened if I would have gone, been born in the hospital? Would my brother, would he have survived because he would have had this great care from a hospital? I was born at home. But Larry, you gotta understand, I was born in a shack that my daddy built with his hands, with a hammer and nails, that's all they had. Two rooms. He said, I don't take anything for granted anymore. He said, you know, you walk into a room, everyone does, and they flip a switch and a light comes on. 
We didn't have electricity in our, that shack. No electricity, Larry. Do you want some water? You want lots of water? You go and you turn the faucet on. <laughs> we didn't have water, running water in our house. We had a well outside. My mom and dad had to get bring a pail out and bring the water into the house. I came from nothing. And here I am sitting in, in Bel Air, California, making movies. So this conversation. How, how did you react to this, that he started talking to you about all these things? What was your reaction to, to that story he told you? And also another thing uh, is that, you know, he was in the 30s at that time or around 30. Elvis was 28. He about his, uh, his uh, dead uh, twin brother at that time. Was that because his mother was often t talking about him or, or why did it was so fresh in Elvis's memory? Well, at that time, Stig, Elvis was 28 years old. I was 24. And I thought and I knew that as Elvis started opening up and he started telling me intimate things about growing up with no money and seeing his mom and his dad struggle, and his, uh, he, he started crying. And tears were in his eyes. And I knew something really profound was happening between Elvis and myself. Because here he is, I'm a stranger. And I thought to myself, he, he doesn't know you. And he's telling you all these things. And I told him things about my life, very intimate things when I was growing up. And I had a tragedy in my family where my grandmother was murdered. And, and I, I'm not going to go into that now, but we both shared stories from our childhood. And I knew that we bonded, we connected, something clicked between Elvis and myself. And I realized, wait a minute, I've been here a couple hours. I have people waiting for me. Peter Sellers, oh my God. I said, Elvis, by the way, <laughs> look, I love talking to you. Now I'll come back anytime you want. If you want to talk some more, and I'll do your hair. But I, I, I got to go. Peter Sellers waiting for me. He said, Peter Sellers, he's my favorite. And Elvis started to imitate Dr. Strangelove. <laughs> and he was so good at it. Uh, you know, Elvis was a, look, we're talking about the number one icon in the history of entertainment. Yeah. No one has ever achieved what this man is. He has more fans today in fan clubs worldwide than any living entertainer. At this moment, Elvis has sold more records and albums than anyone who ever sang a song, an individual or a group. But at the same time, he was a movie star. Yeah. He was a highest paid actor in Hollywood. So we're talking about something else here. This is um, Elvis. And, I, and so he had a, he, he was multi-talented. He did a Brando like no one I've ever seen before. Perfect. Okay. So he's imitating Peter Sellers. <laughs> and I said, look, uh, I was, uh, Peter's waiting for me. He said, look, Larry, I got a great idea. Go back to your salon and tell them that you quit. And you work for Elvis full time. What do you think of that? I, I was shocked. And I didn't have to think. I just knew it was right. It, it was just destiny calling. Yeah. And, I, and he said, look, you meet me tomorrow morning at eight o'clock, Paramount Studios, and bring me some of those books. And this started, the tone was set. And over the next 
13, 14 years, I brought Elvis a lot of books, Big. Yeah. And I'm curious oh. here now, because what was the first book you brought to him? And did you have a lot of thoughts about what books to bring him the first time? Because I can imagine it was important to make the right impression on him. On him. Absolutely. So I brought him a couple of books, three books, the first time. And by the way, over the years, uh, being a bookworm myself, and Elvis became a was a voracious reader. When he read a book, he just didn't read it. He would underline certain passages, make marginal notes, and um, always went back and referred to his books. He was a very intelligent person. You know, the world knows Elvis. Well, like Elvis would say, the world knows Elvis, but they don't know me. They have no idea. He walk into Elvis' room, he have his glasses on reading a book. Very different. <clears throat> yeah, did he use it? Was it reading? Oh. Now I have a I started to pray again because you say something here. He had did he had reading class or or what did he use when he read book? Is he had did he had long side or close side or whatever it's called in English? I don't know. Uh, when, since he used classes for reading. Yeah, yeah, he read so much. And sometimes even in it wasn't too the lighting wasn't that good. And over the next couple of years, he ruined his eyes and he had to wear reading glasses. Otherwise, he couldn't read. Okay. And he had a lot of eye problems. He had glaucoma and he really suffered that way. Uh, but yes, he had to wear glasses. And so I would go to all the bookstores because I knew what he wanted to read. I'm a little bit curious about the first time you came with books. Do you remember what books you brought him and what thoughts oh, you I had certainly about do. Books before you took them for him? Absolutely. I gave the first book I gave him is a book called The Impersonal Life by Joseph Benner. It's a classic. Now a book in fact about 20 years ago the publishers of the book put out the Graceland version with Elvis's, uh, in fact, I have a copy here. If you would like me to, you want to take a moment, I'll go get it Yeah, and show you. It. Yeah, it's fine. Let's see Hold it. Hold on just a minute. Okay. Okay, I didn't know that version. Yeah. Okay. And that is with <laughs> Elvis's underlining Oh, yes. So let me get situated here. So in this book, uh, I mentioned and they it's explained in the introduction uh, what I told you, I, how I gave Elvis this book that became his favorite book. Um, in fact, we made a movie at MGM. Uh, called Harem Scarum. And after Elvis made a movie, he would give everyone that worked on the movie, all the crew and the sound people and the lighting people, all the extras and the actors, and everyone got a gift from Elvis. Elvis said, Larry, go and get me about 100 copies of The Impersonal Life. And so That's I did. That's amazing. <laughs> and uh, he gave one to every person. Um, so that's the first book I gave Elvis. Can, can you just, Story for the Elvis. people who don't know it, Larry, can you tell me a little bit about the book and I'm what it was to. that made Elvis so fascinating about the book? Fascinated right. about the book. Right. So when I got to the studio, Elvis comes in. <clears throat> And he sits down, and I give him, he says, you bring me any of those books? First thing he says, I said, yeah, and I give him the impersonal life. He opens it up, and he says, oh, my God, look at that. Because the book was originally 
published in the 20s and the publishing company was Sun Publishing. When Elvis recorded his first music, it was Sun in Memphis. Yeah. Right? Yes. Right. Yeah. So the book is about Christianity, only coming from it from a very spiritual point of view. It talks about the God within everyone. The spark of life is in every person. And every person has a soul and every person can grow and achieve and it's actually sit in the presence of God. You know, I said, my God, I never read anything like this before. This is the kind of stuff I want to get into. This is what I want to know about. I want to get deeper into inspiration. I want to get directly into what it, this is all about. So this is a very interesting book. And a lot of Elvis fans have read it because Elvis read it. And the book has become a spiritual classic. And it talks about the uh, still small voice within that everyone has that voice within them that is the voice of God. And this really moved Elvis. This really touched him. And I'm going to give you an example a living example. When Elvis uh, sang, and actually he produced his first album that gave him a Grammy, it was gospel music called How Great Thou Art. And we went to Nashville, Tennessee to record that album. And when Elvis was getting ready to go to the studio, he said, Larry, listen, this is not just movie songs that I've been singing. This is not rock and roll music. This is God's music. This is holy, sacred music. And I'm not going to use this voice of mine until I know that my ego is out of the way. I'm not going to get out of this chair until I hear that still, small voice within me letting me know that I'm ready to sing songs like this. So turn the lights down. Let's pray and let's meditate. And that's what we did for about 10, 15 minutes. And we were sitting in the silence in a darkened room in a motel. Nashville, Tennessee, and after a few moments, I heard Elvis say, all right, I'm ready. I'm ready to sing. Let's go. And all this information he got from this book, The Impersonal Life. Yeah, it's amazing. But so over the years, I brought Elvis every book that I had ever read and more. And the very last book I gave to Elvis, um, I gave to him about eight or nine hours before he died at Graceland. And the name of the book is The Secret Search for the Face of Jesus. And it's about the Holy Shroud of Turin. It's the one by Frank Adams, right? Frank Adams is the author for the book. Frank Adams, yeah. exactly. Uh, do you know how much, and now we jump a little bit in it, but how much did Elvis uh, manage to read before he died? Do you know anything about what page? Not he much at all. No. He couldn't have. No. Okay. The book, Elvis's body was found on the floor, and the book was clutched to his chest. So he passed. He died. Yeah. Reading that book. 
just uh, going a little bit back uh, because uh, this book you gave him in personal life uh, actually started his interest and his search for the spiritual uh, life. Do you know if he at that time had been reading uh, the Bible a lot because that was another of his favorite books uh, or did, did that come afterwards? <coughs> when Elvis grew up, <coughs> excuse me, in Tupelo, Mississippi, uh, his mother was um, a church goer and she would bring Elvis to church and he would go as a child and you hear the Bible. But when he grew up, um, he read the Bible occasionally. He was not what you would call a Bible reader. Okay. That's my simple answer. There's much more to this, but in, in this venue with you, Stig, uh, that's all I can say about that. And, and if we go back uh, to, to after he started getting the first books, um, how much time did you spend talking about the books? Was it like you read a book, you gave the book to Elvis, he read it, and then he came back to you with questions and wanted to talk about it, or how did it work? Yes. Elvis read every day of his life. Elvis didn't go to a room unless he had a book or two with him. And he put it on the table, engaged in what was ever happening, but that books were always there. Uh, they were very important to him. And every day for years, let me back up. We made three movies a year. I made 11 movies with Elvis. It's a lot of movies. Every day we would go together, I would do his hair, and we would talk about everything under the sun, from politics to girls, sex, love, current events, but always ending up talking about the deeper realities of life. So at the studio, when we made a movie, I would have to do his, tend to his hair five, six, seven, eight times a day, because after a scene, his hair would fall down here or over here, and it would, these scenes had to match. So we would always run to the dressing room, and there we were in a conversation again. Um, so I hope that kind of answers your question. Yeah, and uh, when you talked about the books, were you deep into some of the passages, some lines from the book, or was it more the, the big picture of the book you were talking about? Uh, it was always in terms of where, what he was going through at that moment, in that situation in life, the movie he was making, or if we were on tour, there's always something going on. And, but behind it all, Elvis was always searching for answers and trying to deepen his understanding and his connection to God, because that's what it's really all about. You can, you can have all sorts of knowledge, but it always comes down to what kind of a relationship do you have with yourself, with God? And that's what was most important to help us. He actually, when I have read your book, I remember uh, some place where he wrote that Elvis told you that uh, that he always believed in God, even though his church has turned him down. He always believed in God, and that way it was some awakeness for him that you came into his life with these books. To Elvis, that's what it's all about. You know, it was it was so interesting to me when I met Elvis. Dick. Most people start looking for answers when things go wrong in their lives, when there's a tragedy, when they lose a job or a relationship, or someone dies and they need answers. They want to know why. What is this all about? Why, why, what is life all about? How do I fit in? Elvis started to search when he had everything. There was nothing wrong. He had what everything life had to offer, fame and fortune beyond the norm. 
so when Elvis achieved all the success and all this fame, he realized that that wasn't the answer. That wasn't the answer. There was, a, there was an emptiness in Elvis, and he wanted to fill it. Now, why that emptiness was there goes into a lot of other areas. Because remember, he was the surviving twin. And that is another dimension to his, the tunnel and root system of his inner life. And also when he started reading all these books, he also got a little bit more adult. Uh, I read somewhere in uh, your book that he got a big compliment from Norman Taruk uh, under the filming. Yes, that's very true. <clears throat> We have to understand Norman Torog was one of the great directors in the history of Hollywood. Um, in fact, to this day, He's the youngest person to ever win an Oscar as a director. Uh, at any rate, he was Elvis's favorite director, made seven or eight movies with Elvis. One afternoon, he said to Elvis, he said, Elvis, I don't know what you've been going through, but we've known each other for years now. We've worked on a lot of movies together. But I have noticed such a profound change in you. I see you reading books, getting very serious with your life. Whatever you're doing, don't stop. Keep on doing it. It's really good, Elvis. And it shows. Elvis was glorious when he heard this. It meant up so much to him, coming from a man of the stature of Norman Torog. And in what way could his closest friends see the difference on Elvis, except, of course, he was reading a lot. But in what way was the change? Well, I'll tell you what way. Uh, before 1964, on the movie sets, um, Elvis was a little wilder. They would uh, fill balloons and throw them and run on the set and act like a lot of teenagers, Elvis in the group, that stopped. All of a sudden, Elvis grew up. He was 28 years old, and he became more serious with his life, and a lot of the old things changed. And Mr. Torog, he recognized this. In, in your book, you write about uh, Elvis had his spiritual quest, and you write about Diamata uh, that he met and brother Adolf. Can you tell a little bit about this uh, quest and about uh, Diamata and Brother Adolf and Elvis and you? I sure can. Um, you know, Elvis had, uh, even, it was so interesting. Most people start searching for answers to life when things go wrong for them when there's a tragedy in the family or they lose, they lose a loved one or a job or a relationship. People start looking, they want, they want to know the, the deeper answers to life itself. In Elvis's case, we have a person who had everything, fame, fortune, he, had, he was young, the whole world was in front of him, He had millions of fans around the world. He had everything that life had to offer and even more so. And yet at the same time, he had this inner need because he wasn't fulfilled. And he would say, fame and fortune, money, fame, that's not the answer to life. There's more to life than that. There's much more. And Elvis was on a quest to find out answers that are in the Bible and in other teachings. And I gave him several books and he read them. In fact, he read books every day of his life. We had a tremendous library. And 
he, I told him about this lady. <clears throat> Her name was Shri Dayamata. Uh, she was a, uh, an American who took on a Hindu name. And she was the president of Self-Realization Fellowship that was started by Paramahansa Yogananda, a man who came over from India to America in the 1920s, started Self-Realization Fellowship, which today there are centers around the world. In fact, he wrote many books. And the first book he wrote was called Autobiography of a Yogi. And it sold millions of copies. And um, people like Marilyn Monroe read it. George Harrison read it. Uh, Steve Jobs of Apple, that inspired his life. Well, it inspired Elvis as well, and he wanted to meet her, and he knew that I knew her. I set up a meeting uh, in Los Angeles, and one evening around 9, 10 o'clock, we went to the headquarters of Self-Realization Fellowship, which is called SRF. And we went there, and we sat with her, and Elvis just opened up and told her how much he enjoyed all the books that he's been reading, and he loves to meditate. And he said to her, I want, I want more teachings. I want you to give me whatever you can, which she did. And she turned around, and she picked up a, uh, a very special book that was never published and gave it to Elvis. She said, I want you to study these. These are very special lessons. And Elvis treasured them. And he became very close to Sri Dayamata. He would call her Ma. And he would call her up on the phone. And over the years, we would go back to have meetings with her. Now, as I mentioned, there are several uh, self-realization fellowships in Los Angeles, and one of the big ones is right by the Pacific Ocean, and it's called the Lake Shrine. It's about 14, 15 acres, and there's a lake, and there's swans, and it's a very, very beautiful grounds, and people from all around the world go there, and on a, at a special place on the lawn, there's a big urn that has some of the ashes of Mahatma Gandhi. And Elvis never was there before. And they have a big meditation garden. So I took Elvis. And when we walked, and when we were driving there, he said to me, do you think anyone's going to bother me? Are they going to run up to me? I said, no, Elvis. It's a very, very spiritual place. People go here for calmness, for serenity. The, the whole grounds is very peaceful. It has a windmill and a chapel. And let's go. Don't worry. And we had a few of our people with us. I said, there'll be no one's going to bother you. So we walked around the lake on a beautiful path. And people walked by. And they would nod at Elvis, but no one came up to him. Everyone was very, very respectful. And when we left that afternoon, Elvis said, man, this place is so beautiful. I'm telling you, this is exactly what I want. I've got to have a meditation garden. And this is how and the reason why there's a meditation garden at Graceland. Because when we came back to Memphis, that was the very first order of the day. Elvis started to create a meditation garden right to the side of the mansion and brought in contractors and various people. And they worked on it for many months. Little did we know in our wildest imagination, 
that that was going to become the final resting place of Elvis Presley. At any rate, that afternoon at the Lake Shrine was really beautiful because there were several monks that lived there and the, the caretaker, the, uh, the elder statesman, was a gentleman by the name of Brother Adolf and he lived upstairs in the windmill and I introduced them and Adolf started telling all the stories, spiritual stories. And he said, and before we left that afternoon, our brother Adolf said to Elvis, remember Elvis, you are the biggest star in this world and you're now meditating, you're learning a lot of new things. The most important thing for you is to maintain a balance in your life. You're making movies, you're, you're singing, doing albums, and you're out there in the world doing a lot of things. People are flaunting themselves to you, throwing themselves at you. Just remain calm as much as you can and keep that balance in your life. It's so important because a lot of celebrities, they go off the deep end and this is what my message is to you. Did he follow these good advice he got from Brother Adolf and from Diamata? Well, the thing is, Elvis was Elvis. His lifestyle was at one of the fastest pace you can imagine. Every day in his life was like a year. <laughs> so many things happened. And, you know, making movies in the 60s and then in the 70s, touring the country over and over and over, nonstop, flying to city to city. It's a very, very, very fast pace of life. He did his best to maintain as much balance in his life as possible. We would meditate every, every night after a show. We would meditate together. This is very, very important to Elvis. And I don't remember, Stig, if I mentioned to you that before he recorded the album, how great thou art. We were in Nashville, Tennessee, and we we're getting ready to go to RCA Victor Recording Studio to record that album. And Elvis said to all the guys that worked for him, listen, you guys, Larry and I need to talk by ourselves before we leave. So just go outside to the cars. I'll be down in a minute. And Elvis said to me, he said, Larry, this album that I'm going to start recording tonight, this is not like the songs I sing in movies. This is not rock and roll. This is something else. This is sacred music. This is spiritual music. And we don't know who's going to listen to it. And if one person can be touched by this music, then I will have done my job. So what I mean and what I'm getting at is this. I'm not going to I'm not going to leave this chair and go to that studio and use this voice until I know that my ego is out of the way. This has got to be pure. This has got to come from the depths of my heart and soul. So turn the lights down. Let's meditate, and I'll know when I'm ready. And that's what we did, Stig. Okay. For about 50, how long about time? 50, how long time did you meditate? I would say we uh, uh, in real time, anywhere from 12 to 15 minutes. Okay. And we're meditating. We were quiet. We said a prayer, and all of a sudden, I heard Elvis say very softly, "All right." I'm ready. Let's hit it. 
We went to the studio and it was magic. And the interesting thing is, here's the king of rock and roll. Here's a person to this day, right now, in 2021, who has sold more records and albums than any other group or single person who ever sang a song. Elvis is still number one for rock and roll, for popular music, for all sorts of music, country and Western. He was the greatest crossover star and singer that ever lived. Yeah. And yet he won his Grammy for gospel. Yeah. Which is kind of appropriate. It really, really is. Because that, that kind of music was Elvis's background. That was his tunnel and root system. That's where he came from. That's where he learned music in the church. I remember Elvis would say, I knew when I was three years old that I wanted to be a singer. I remember sitting on my mama's lap in church and the choir was down there and they were singing and all I wanted to do is jump off her lap and run down and stand up with these people and sing with them. I knew it then. Amazing. I have a question regarding the meditation garden to jump to that. Uh, you talked about it before. Um, was Elvis very much involved with the designing of the meditation garden? Absolutely. A lot of Elvis, meditation oh, without a doubt. Work. Elvis was involved in every aspect of it. He knew where he wanted certain pillars and statues to be. Uh, he knew what the basic design what, would be because this is what he told the people that, that actually did the actual work. He told them what he wanted. And as they were doing everything, he would make a couple changes. So the meditation garden today, where Elvis and his family are buried, is exactly what he wanted. Of course, then there was no grave sites. And many times during those days, we'd walk outside and we'd sit down and we'd just, you know, drink some lemonade and talk and use that area just to relax and to unwind. Because now it, it's the very epicenter of the Elvis world. And uh, and uh, between you and me, don't we don't tell anybody. But is he really buried there, or is he over uh, near uh, the the big statue of uh, of uh, Jesus Christ? Between yeah, that me, was... don't tell anybody. Oh, Elvis wanted that, and I'm going to tell you why. When we went to the lake shrine the very first time, we walked around the lake, and there's a mound. A little hill that we walked up and there was a big statue of Jesus and that's what inspired Elvis to have that statue put right there that's still there today Larry you and Elvis was also into numerology uh, and uh, especially the number eight uh, was very interesting for you can you tell a little bit about that yeah Elvis was very much into uh, what is known today as numerology. Um, and Elvis was born January 8th. So according to the main system and books that he would read, uh, his prime number was eight because of the 8th of January. And um, so he would read a lot of books along these lines. And this was something that really was of deep interest to him. And um, several people on the group were eights as well. And uh, Colonel Parker is an eight because he was born June 26. Two and six are eight. 
And as it turned out, the last time El Elvis ever sang in public was on the Colonel's birthday on the number eight. Okay. And by the way, uh, I believe that's the day that Vernon died as well. And okay. other people like George Klein was an eight and other people in the group. So this was very significant to Elvis. Isn't that uh, surprising that you have misunderstood? Did Elvis feel misunderstood in some ways? <laughs> Did he? he? Elvis absolutely felt misunderstood. In what way? Uh, he said, when I came on the scene in 19, in the night, when I came on the scene and became Elvis, man, a lot of people, <clears throat> they didn't get my music. A lot of preachers thought I was leading all the teenagers on the path to hell. There were, there were bonfires. They were burning my music. They didn't get me. He said, Hollywood never got me. He said, basically, I'm an, I'm an actor. But they never understood that. They thought I was just this rock and roll guy that wanted to make rock and roll movies. That's not what I'm all about. And Elvis did feel misunderstood, no question about it. And now we're jumping a little bit ahead because we, we don't want to, we should not use too much time on it. I just want to go a little bit around. Uh, just make you talk about the time where Elvis hit the head and the Colonel Tom Parker didn't want you and the books in his life anymore. Uh, how, how did you feel about that? That must have been a terrible moment for you and for Elvis. Well, yeah. Um, Elvis was a voracious reader. There are so many pictures of Elvis and he's carrying books in his hand. People can see this. Elvis read, as I mentioned, every day of his life. He came into his house on the stand next to him, there'd be a stack of books. In his bedroom, stack of books. We had a fabulous library that got bigger and bigger and bigger. Wherever he went on tour, two huge trunks were filled with his favorite books. And the guys would have to carry these big trunks and they would put them into Elvis's bedroom. And he had a portable library wherever he went. Now, when he started to read books, this is all new to the people around him, and especially to Colonel Parker, his manager. The colonel didn't know what was going on. And he would get reports back from some of the guys that Elvis is reading all the time. Elvis is reading all these far out books. What kind of books is he reading? What's going on? So one afternoon, Elvis said to me, hey, listen, I got a call. I've got to go to the colonel's office at MGM Studios. Come on, come with me. So we got in the back seat of the Rolls Royce and a few of the guys were in the front, a couple of cars behind us of guys. We all went to MGM Studios. You know, so I have no idea what he wants, but he's just got to talk to me. This is important. So we drive up, we go, into this, we go on the grounds of MGM, drive up to the big sign, Elvis Exploitations, that's the Colonel's office. Elvis said to me, stay here with the guys. I'll be back. Let me see what he wants. So Elvis goes to meet with the colonel. And about 15 minutes later, he walks out towards us. And the minute I saw him, I could tell, uh-oh, something's up. Just by his body language and the look in his face, I almost saw smoke coming out of him. <laughs> He gets in the back seat, he sits down, and he started, he started swearing. 
and using language I'm not going to use now. Yeah. And he said that SOB, that fat SOB, he accused me of being on a religious kick. I'm not, and I told him, hey, Colonel, I'm not on any kick. What I read, what I study is what I am. This is what I'm really all about. He said, the Colonel doesn't get me. The Colonel doesn't get me. He better just take care of business. He does a great job. That's what he does. He knows how to do it, but he better not step over the line into my personal life because I'm not going to stand for it. He's supposed to take care of business. I'll take care of my own life. And Elvis was, he got very, very agitated of several of the things that the colonel told him. And he said, he told me about you, Larry. He said, why is he bringing you all these books? What are these books you're reading? And I told him, Mel, I said, Colonel, these are fantastic, fantastic information. They're inspirational. They're about God. They're about a beautiful way of living. This is what the Bible is all about. This is what the sacred teachings are all about. And I knew that the colonel, <laughs> he didn't like these. What he was afraid of was that I was trying to tear the Elvis away from him. And he did not want Elvis to become that independent. He wanted to keep his controls. And, and you know, even, even, when the, even when the Beatles came to meet Elvis, he didn't want any pictures. He wanted to control everything that happened that night. And that's why not one picture was allowed. That's amazing. The colonel kept his controls as much as he could. And in 1966, Elvis uh, fall and hit his head and the uh, and, uh, bodyguards. No, no, no. Um, that was uh, 1967. 67, yeah, okay. okay. And the colonel comes and he uh, says things are going to be changed now. And then shortly after, uh, you, you have to leave or what happens? Uh, we were getting ready to uh, go to the studio to film Clambake at Universal Studios. And the, the first day of filming, I got to Elvis's house about 7.30 in the morning to drive with him to the studio. And we're all waiting for Elvis to come out of his bedroom. He came out and he walked very, very slowly and he was holding his head and he sat down on the couch. He said, oh, man, something happened, you guys. Something happened to me. In the middle of the night, I got up to go to the bathroom, and I don't know what happened. He said, all of a sudden, I fell. He said, I don't know if someone hit me, or I fell and I hit my head. I don't know what happened, but I got a big lump on my head. And he said, come on, come and feel it. And everyone came over, and they put... He gently touched, he had a big lump right up here on top of his head. He said, I don't think I can go to the studio, call the colonel. About an hour later, the colonel came in. And after all these years, from 1964, after working with Elvis and living with him in the Graceland and 11 movies and giving him books for the first time, the colonel came up, when he came in the house, he said, I don't want him reading any more books. No more books. The, the movie was put on hold. And Elvis stopped reading for a very short period of time. But didn't stop him. <laughs> it never stopped him. He started reading more afterwards. You, you didn't see Elvis for some years, but then Johnny Rivers got you uh, to see a show with Elvis, and you saw Elvis. Oh, oh well, we, you know, we finished the movie, and it was, uh, it was always fun working on movies, even though Elvis didn't like those scripts. Uh, 
they're, they're all the same to him. And he just couldn't stand making the same movie over and over and over again. He said, all they do is they change my name. It's, it's like the same set, the same script. I just have a different name. He did like making, there's two movies that he really did like move, uh, making. Harem Scarum, because he wore these outfits. They were very cool. He loved it. He would love wearing those turbans. And that, so that was kind of special for him. And they made another movie called Frankie and Johnny. And that was a classic story. It wasn't just like all the other movies he made. And, this, and the, the, the screenplay was on a higher level than the, the other movies. So we finished making Clambake, and I decided that I was going to leave Elvis and not work for him anymore. Because of what happened, which is a whole other story that I'm not going to go into right now, and another time I will. Um, I, I left on my own. I could have stayed, but I knew that it was better for me as a person for other reasons and for Elvis. And I knew the circle would eventually come back to itself again. So a couple of years later, I get a phone call from the singer Johnny Rivers. And he says, Larry, I just, Elvis just called me. He really needs you. We have to go to Vegas. Priscilla left him. He's really going through something. And he said, I got to have Larry here. I got to see him. So we went to Vegas. It was the first time I saw Elvis in a couple of years. And it was a fantastic, reunion and we walked up to one another in his dressing room we hugged and he said come on man let's go upstairs we got to talk we went upstairs we walked into his bedroom and the first thing i saw stacks of about i would say 15 20 bucks and i knew then and there Yep. And I saw that those were the same books that I had given him. And they look old to me at this point. Because he, he, when Elvis read a book, he would read them over and over and over again. Just like movies. When Elvis saw a movie that he liked, he would watch it over and over. He saw some movies four or five times. I'm telling you, that we saw Dr. Strangelove maybe 20, 30 times over the years. It's amazing. Yeah. And also, uh, according to your book, uh, when you saw all these books, especially one of them, it looked very, very used. And you said to Elvis, I will bring you a new one, Elvis. And what did Elvis say to you? So Elvis said to me, no, 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 no. I like, I like the books in those conditions. I like them old like that. You can bring new ones, but don't, I don't want to get rid of these. I want to keep them. And he did. And over the next, let's see, that was August 72 until August of 77. I can't tell you how many books I brought, new books. So it just started burgeoning. And we had a, we had a very impressive library. Most of it was kept in his bedroom and there was other rooms upstairs that in his office there were a lot of books um yeah and i gave him a book of course a couple hours at graceland before he passed away i gave him a book and of course he died reading the book yeah but but you also sitting very often with him in the bedroom talking about the books many 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 times he sat in his bedroom Absolutely. And it was very cold in there, wasn't it? That's what I've been told. I swear to you. Sometimes I dreaded walking to his room. It'd be in the dead of winter. 
we'd be on tour. It'd be snowing outside. You walk into his bedroom, it was like walking into an icebox. He loved, he, the air condition was always on and it was cold, very cold, yes. That Elvis also liked to pray and heal his grandma that he loved so much when she said she didn't feel good. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, when Elvis was a kid growing up in Tupelo, he had a very bad case of asthma and allergies. And he would we wheeze and try to catch his breath. And he would tell me that his back started to itch him like crazy, that he would take his shirt off and stand next to a tree and go and rub his skin against the bark of the tree because his skin itched so much. His mother would bring some of the lady friends home from church and they would put their hands on Elvis and heal him. It's called laying on of hands. Millions of people do this today. Religious people do this and they pray and they know that they become conduits, channels for God to heal people. Not that they're the healers, but God is the healer. Well, Elvis felt that he was a healer and he was. One day, we were at Graceland and uh, his father came up and said, Elvis, grandma is having one of her spells. She doesn't feel good at all. Why don't you go in there, talk to her, make her feel good. And he said, okay, come on, Larry. So we walked into grandma's room and she was propped up in bed. He walked up to her and he said, grandma, how you feeling? And she said, I'm not doing too good, Elvis. I'm not doing good at all. I don't feel right. He said, honey, don't worry. I'll take care of everything. You mind if I give you, and Larry with me, an old fashioned healing? She said, honey, you do whatever you want. <laughs> she would love to do anything. He said, okay. Larry, turn the lights down. So I turned the lights down and we went to grandma and said a prayer. We put our hands and Elvis put her hand, his hand on her forehead and on her head and up here and on her arms. And this went on for about 10, 15 minutes. And we stopped and he said, grandma, how, how are you feeling now? She says, I really am feeling better, Elvis. I'm really feeling better. Thank you, honey. Thank you. Now I tell you something very, very odd, very ironic. When we left her room, we walked out. And he looked at me and said, you know what? She's a strong lady. I bet you she outlives me. And he said it as a joke. This is exactly what happened. Yeah, life has its mysterious ways sometimes. Thank you very much, Larry. All right, Stig. It was but great will, talking I, with you. I will just make a close one and then I will put on the camera just two seconds. I'll just say thank you very much, Larry. It was a big pleasure to talk with you. Oh, thank you, Stig. I love talking about Elvis and speaking with you. My pleasure, Larry. Thank you very much. And to you thank out you. there, thank you very much for watching this program. I hope to see you all another time. Thank you.